Hey everyone, Jai here. Welcome to my new YouTube channel. I've been wanting to do one for a while now, but I guess I was just waiting for the right topic to do it on. You know, obviously today's your lucky day because if you clicked on this video, you know what we're going to be going through. We're going through, in my opinion, Australia's best bang for buck performance car. Obviously for all the people living in Australia, we sort of know that Australia is not known for cheap performance cars. Let's say when we're compared to America, we pay double or more the majority of our performance cars. For example, the 911 Turbo S in America, I believe, I've just Googled it real quick, you can look at it yourselves, get it for $190,000, which seems like a lot of money, but in Australian terms, the same car is going for 400 plus. That's how crazy it is over here. So I guess what I'll be reviewing today is going, hey, do you know what? I'm not going to be looking at brand new cars because in my opinion, brand new cars not the way to go for cheap performance. There's actually pretty good cars out there now in the secondhand market for prices you wouldn't really expect. And I guess I didn't really expect either. Look, I'm just going to go through a bit of a journey of what I did to find the right car for me. And yeah, hopefully it opens your mind up too. As I sort of mentioned earlier in the video I'm about 911 Turbo S prices. Look at this, you can find this within a minute of Googling it. Over in America, 161,000 for just the turbo models. And when you scroll down, you can see Turbo S here from 190,000. Let's compare that to the exact same thing here in Australia. So it looks like pretty much the exact same screen. Yeah, turbo models, Turbo S, yeah, all right. Look at that, same thing, yeah? All right, let's have a look at some driveway prices right now. Put some numbers in, and let's just have a look. 500,000, is that not ridiculous right now? And you know, what was it, 190? Yep, and that's sort of why I am sort of going in the direction I am, which means never buying a brand new car, because that is just ridiculous. I guess the other thing some people don't realize is uh, in Australia we have the luxury car tax. So it even shows here cars with a luxury car tax value over the luxury car tax threshold, which is below, track the rate of 33% tax. So here's a threshold, right? So pretty much for most vehicles, it's 66,000. As soon as it gets over that, you start incurring luxury car tax. And then they've also got another threshold for fuel efficient vehicles. The other thing about how luxury car tax works is it's paid only once. So whoever buys the car brand new, they pay this luxury car tax. As soon as they sell it on a secondhand market, you don't have to pay that anymore because it's only paid once. So that takes me to the next part of my journey because I'm not gonna be looking at new cars. Depreciation and luxury car tax puts me off. Secondhand car market seems a pretty good way to go. I guess what I'm chasing is, I'm, I'm looking for a Euro, probably one of the big three, BMW, Mercedes or Audi. I've had Japanese cars in the past, and to be honest, the Japanese cars that I want, they're getting a bit too old now. But the stuff that I'll be actually looking for is GDRs and whatnot. I've had GDRs in the past, I had R35, but let's have a look at GDRs, for example, because this is probably the only Japanese car that I'm actually interested in. Uh, you can sort here in car sales. And the ones I'll actually be looking for is actually the R34 GDR, right? But, Jesus. I haven't even looked at GDRs for a while. This is how crazy it's getting. 110,000 for R32. 74,000 for R33. Okay, I have not looked at GDRs for a while. This is crazy expensive. They're getting more expensive than R35s. Wow. Inspect no, that'd be nice. These have really gone up in price because um, they've just hit the uh, US market. So America can now start importing GDRs. So they cross the, uh, they're tw over 25 years old. So now demand for them is skyrocketing. That is crazy. And I guess in my head, the other side of it is, let's say you get an R34, even if it was reasonably priced. One thing that you don't really get in them is actually any real luxury or creature comforts you get in a Euro car. 
and after having a few Euro cars, that's one thing I'm sort of, I know, I sort of value a bit more now. When I was a teenager and whatnot, never really cared, you know, you just wanted something fast that was easy to mod. But yeah, well, these are crazy expensive and also not as luxurious anymore, which is something I'm looking for. So definitely doesn't fall into that bang for buck conversation anymore. I'm moving on. Look, I've always been into the E60 M5s. Always thought they're a ultra cool car. For what you can pay for them these days, they're pretty good bang for buck. Jesus, even look at this. This is the F10 M5 and it's about the same price as the GDR. Very different cars, obviously. So, you know, remember when I'm going through this though, I'm not really comparing like for like. I'm just saying what you can get for your money. If you compare what GDRs now, and yes, they're iconic, they're awesome, and I would love to own one. And just to prove it, look, I have that as my background. That's, I've always wanted R34. But the other side of it is like, you can get one of these for the same price now, right? But no, uh, you know, I'm not really looking at anything this expensive either. I'm sort of looking at stuff under 50K. When you start getting into this bracket of 90,000 and above, and I'll do some videos on that later on, you know, I'll do it by price bracket. But at the moment, you know, I'm thinking of stuff in under 50K, that's good. And I know the E60s are definitely within that bracket. Look at this, 35,000 for E60. You ever have a few Ks on them, so let's limit our Ks to 150,000. Let's, let's see what we've got. 40, pretty reasonable. These all have the iconic V10. I think I actually gone up a bit in price. I think there was more in the 30,000s, maybe because I had higher Ks on them. That could be it. The one thing about these M5s though, is the SMG gearbox. They all have the SMG gearbox. Oh, actually no, maybe some have a manual, but very, very rare. Actually, I actually I might Google that too. Um, V60 M5 manual. Popular American market. Huh. Wow. How about that? Well, nothing I can get here. Look, I used to have an M6, I think also 2006 M6. Um, that had a V10 engine and that was a kick-ass car. But after owning that SMG gearbox, I don't think I want to own another car with it. Yeah, it was not a, it's not good to drive. It's pretty much the first generation of the automated manuals. Very clunky, wasn't responsive, wasn't smooth. It was, it actually really put me off. So that's really put me off M5s in a way as well because I know they have the same gearbox. The other BMW that is definitely something that I'm interested in is the M3s. I do like the E46, but they also have SMG gearbox. So I'll be looking at the E92 M3s. Now, there's a reason why I've actually put 2009 as my minimum. Reason behind that is at come 2009, from that year onwards, they had the new iDrives. So you can see here, See, that's a new iDrive system. And I used to have a BMW 135i, I believe it was a 2012 model, 2012, 2013, that had the new iDrive, and that was um, really easy to use. And my M6 I had before that was a 2006, so it had the old iDrive, and after having a new one, it's pretty damn hard to go back, to be honest. And I know it's something that people probably don't care about, but Obviously, I'm looking for something for myself, and yeah, after you have certain creature comforts, it's sort of hard to go back. But you can sort of see these cars, under 40,000. Now, that definitely is a price range that I'm sort of looking in at the moment. I think these are very well priced for what you get. These are probably gonna be the last of the naturally aspirated M cars. Um, everything these days coming out with uh, turbos, and these are pretty damn fun to drive. Very responsive, more track orientated, very high revving. I think revs over 8,000. Um, very dynamic cars. There's quite a few out there around the 40,000 mark. 
And to be honest, I'm actually liking the look of the sedans more than the, the coupes. I think they're a bit more practical and um, they have something about them. But the coupes do look nice, don't they? Especially with the carbon roof. One thing I find in Australia, a lot of people are getting away from the carbon roofs. They're opting for the uh, sunroofs, right? Like, look here, for example, look at, look at this sunroof. Like, I know some people like, but we're in Australia. Who wants more sun? You really want more sun? And like, you could have a carbon fiber roof, reduce like the center of gravity. I don't know, some people like the look. Ooh, manual one. But yeah, I guess if I had an M3, the first thing I'd probably change is the grills. Um, I love the black grills. That's pretty much everything. Every BMW that I've, I've bought, I've always got the black grills straight up. All right, let's move to the next one. I really like the new RS3. Um, having said that, I think, let's say, if we look at the M3 and say that's currently in the lead, you can see the RS3, especially the new ones, Let's go high to low. A way more expensive than that. A hundred thousand ninety eighty six eighty ish high eighties by the looks of things. And is this really double the car the E ninety two M three is? In my opinion, not. Yeah, they look damn cool. But double the car, it's pretty hard to justify that price, right? I'll tell you what, that's one thing that um, all the new cars have done. They've moved the interior game on. You know, you sort of go back to the older style generation. Um, and that's one thing that sort of gets left behind is the interiors. But it's a step to game up. Um, if you're paying that sort of price, look at this. 2010 RS6, 78. 79. This is crazy. That's a thousand dollars, two thousand dollars more. 23,000 Ks on it. These are the V10 twin turbos. How crazy is this? 426 kilowatt. Finally, a V10 twin turbos. That is ridiculously good bang for buck. But, like I said, is it? Still double the car, the M3 is. And I'll tell you what, the older Audis, 2009 Audis, the Audis have always done good interiors. Jeez. This is actually a real good bang for buck car, but not in a price range that I'm looking in at the moment. Damn. Uh, I would probably take that over a new RS3 considering it's cheaper. All right, well, let's look at the direct competitor to the M3 at its time, right? So you have the B7 RS4s. These are pretty damn well priced. They've actually, the cheapest one in Australia is actually below $30,000. That's a whole lot of car for that price. 309 kilowatt. Also 4.2 litre V8. Um, one thing I've heard about these Audis though is that over time, they actually have performance issues. So I was just reading up on some forums. Power, lots of power from oil deposits building up on the back of the intake valves due to recirculated oil mist that isn't cleaned off by port injection because it's direct injection. Yeah, it's carbon choking issue. That's a pretty well known thing. So that's always playing in the back of my mind that you know, um, over time, you're just going to have to clean that out. It's going to be annoying. If I want something that's a bit low maintenance, I don't have to really worry about other than the standard servicing. Love to look at these cars. They were mean looking, eh? Look at that. Manual. Mean looking. 35 grand. Whoa. Carbon inserts? Oh, I love carbon inserts. That looks pretty sexy. Audis do make good interiors. Whew, 35 grand. M3, about the same price. With a DCT. All right, moving on to the Mercedes. 
Look at this shit. C63s around the same price as the RS4. This is one car that has always enticed me away from Beamers. Never really been a big fan of Mercedes until the C63 came out. And this 6.2 litre V8, it sounds menacing. And for the price that they are at the moment, that is cheaper than M3s. About the same price as RS4s without the carbon build up issue. And yeah, the, the interior, I believe, of these, um, they're not too great. They're, they still look a bit old school. They have the um, flip up screens. And they still have numbers. They have numbers in here. Like, uh, like you actually dial using these numbers or something. It's not quite the same standard as the BMW Audis, to be honest. I'll tell you what, though, the engine makes up for it. The exterior looks kick ass for a car that old, to be honest. With. I reckon it still looks good now. Look at that. The lines there, it looks aggressive. I actually like the stock rims there, you know? Looks mean. Probably the best looking exterior out of all three. Probably the worst looking interior. But probably the best engine out of all three, I would think. Yeah, the BMW's got an awesome engine too, but 6.2 litre V8 in this. Yeah. I guess I'll just jump forward to what I got in the end, eh? So this is what I believed to be the most bang for buck car you can buy right now that suited what I wanted. And there we go, that's what I ended up getting. A 2010 uh, C63 AMG. Um, couldn't really go past it really. Found this pretty clean example here in WA from a dealer. But um, yeah, really good shape for the year. Um, the paint works actually very nice. Um, you know, there's a couple of chips in here and there, which you would sort of expect for a car of this age. But you can sort of see, you know, um, fairly good paint. And I haven't really even given a, a really good detail yet. But um, yeah, happy with the purchase. Um, amazing engine. Handles a a lot better than what I expected but um just the stance on it, it looks just it's just mean looking you know? quad exhaust um yeah We're very happy to purchase so look going forward if you're interested I'll be putting up more videos like this um probably a bit of a review of the car itself and um yeah very happy.